Hello, welcome back to your favorite solo true crime adventure. I don't know why I have said that the last three episodes. It's just what immediately popped into my head. Anyway, welcome back. I hope you're having a great time. I still don't know what order I'm going to release these in, so <laughs> not a whole lot to say. Because I have recorded three in a row now, so that I could be prepared when I got my tonsil surgery. So not a lot of beginning banter either, like I said, just because I don't know uh, what day it is and I don't know what I have done before I release this. So we can just get right into it, I guess. This one I am also very excited to do. It's one of those that I had to dedicate sort of a lot of time to because there is so much information all spread out everywhere. It's so funny, I just did Monica Lewinsky. Another one I recorded today was one of the first things I put on my list, and now this one was the another one of the very, very early ones I put on my list back in 2019, whenever we started this. So, obviously, you know, I'm doing the assault of Nancy Kerrigan, which is the Tanya Harding case, which is what I, Tanya, was based off of, which was an amazing movie. Margot Robbie is amazing. If you haven't seen that movie, it's really good. And Allison Janney won an Oscar for it. And she deserved it because she played Tanya's mom real good. So, Tanya Maxine Harding was born November 12th, 1970 in Portland, Oregon to Lavona Golden and Albert Harding. A prevalent theme in Tanya's life is how she grew up. She is, like, constantly referred to as rough around the edges, especially when she is contrasted against Nancy Kerrigan. Like, it always comes up that she just, like, rough around the edges is like a good way to put it but they always reference like how she grew up where she grew up how her attitude was things like that so you'll notice that once we get into it so tanya's father struggled to hold jobs because of his poor health so tanya's mother had to work to support the family as a waitress tanya paints her mother in a very harsh light and it's reflected in the movie i tanya if you've seen it tanya claimed she was frequently abused by her mother She stated that by the time she was seven years old, physical and psychological abuse had become a regular part of her life. She became very abusive and was drinking all day long, Tanya said, beating me, dragging me off the rink, hitting me with a hairbrush right in front of everyone. And her mom did admit to one instance of hitting Tanya at the ice rink. In an article on Vulture, they did compare the movie in real life to see what was actually true. And according to a woman who took lessons at the same rink as Tanya during the time she started training... Tanya's mother did shout at her daughter, I paid for you to practice, so you're going to stay on the ice and practice. In a Chicago Tribune article from 1994, this policy did mean that Tanya was sometimes forced to urinate on the ice, according to people who knew her then, because that was seen in the movie when young Tanya was forced to pee on the ice instead of leaving to go for a bathroom break, because they didn't have a lot of money. So Tanya's mom was like, I paid for you to practice, I'm not paying you to go pee. So someone did come out and say that... Tanya's mom did shout something of the sort at her. But Tanya's mom always maintains that she was just always trying her best, which I could see what she means. She probably felt that way as she was supporting her family financially. She was putting Tanya in ice skating, and she was hand-sewing all of Tanya's outfits to save money. Tanya's mom would send Tanya to school on picture day in her skating outfit and hair done for skating competitions. That way Tanya would have headshots for competitions. So, like, Tanya didn't have, like, normal school photos. She double dipped and got headshots instead in a documentary made by sandra lucklow tanya talks about calling her mom after a competition she goes so i heard you missed your combination you know you didn't get any credit for that at all and tanya said mom and her mom said you did terrible you know that you sucked and tanya said mom i got half a credit for it and she's and tanya's mom said so the rest of the program sucked too Sandra Lucklow said Tanya wanted and needed what every child wants and needs. She wanted the love and support and approval of her parents. Whether she got it or not, I don't know, but she didn't feel it. In a lot of ways, Tanya has never gotten away from that voice she heard in that phone conversation. A family friend actually spoke out after the movie came out and said that Tanya's mom wasn't that bad. Like, it was very exaggerated. Tanya was making a lot of that stuff up. However, one of Tanya's brief fiancés between her many relationship with Jeff Galuli, I'll get into that later, attested to how awful Tanya's mom was. He said that Tanya had him get on a phone extension after she called her mom when she placed second in a very big competition. He said that after that, Tanya asked her mother if she had seen the performance on TV, and he said he heard her mother tell her that her routine was awful, your hair looked terrible, and asked if she was gaining weight. He had said later in an interview that Tanya had told me how awful her mother was, and I had always told her that nobody could be that awful. 
And after that phone conversation, I thought, oh my God, this woman really is awful. So there are some people out there who said like the things Tanya was saying were true because I saw it with my own eyes and ears. In her authorized biography, The Tanya Tapes, she said she was the victim of acquaintance rape in 1991 and that her half-brother Chris Davidson molested her on several occasions when she was a child. In 1986, Tanya called the police after Davidson had been sexually harassing and terrorizing her. She was getting ready for her first date with her eventual husband, and he walked in and was trying to kiss her. She threatened him and then touched him with a hot curling iron and ran. He busted down her bedroom door and came after her. She was able to get out and call the police. He was arrested and spent a short amount of time in prison, actually. Tanya said her parents were in denial about Davidson's behavior and told her not to press criminal charges against him. Tanya's own mother admitted that she wouldn't put it past Chris to try and get a kiss, while at the same time claiming that her daughter had a tendency to tell tall tales. She also slapped Tanya across the face and accused her of lying. And I think at this time, Tanya meets her eventual husband. She's like 15. And I think Chris Davidson was like 26 at this time. So it's like, it's a very terrifying situation, honestly. Davidson was killed in an unsolved vehicular hit-and-run accident in 1988. On May 3rd, 1994, during an interview with Rolanda Watts, Tanya said that Davidson was the only person in her life unworthy of forgiveness and said, the only person I have ever hated. She loved her dad. He bought her her first gun when she was five, which I couldn't believe when I read that. He taught her how to hunt, fish, fix cars, all of that. But her parents got divorced in 1985, and Tanya's mom married her sixth husband, Tanya had lived in eight homes in 18 years, by the way. So her home life just wasn't the greatest to sum that entire section up. So this all led her into the arms of her first husband. Tanya met Jeff Galuli when she was 15 and he was, was around 17 or 18. And because her home life was so volatile and unstable, she really found like a lot of peace with Jeff at first. Like he was almost an escape. They met at the mall where she worked at in Portland, Oregon. They would go on dates to the movies with Tanya's dad chaperoning them. So they had been together for three years when her mom remarried in 1985 or 86. Tanya was 18 by then, and her mother and her new husband allegedly kicked her out, and then she moved in with Jeff. A year later, in 1990, Tanya and Jeff Galuli got married. She maintains that it was so that she could be covered, covered under his health insurance, which I understand. Tanya's mother said, I tried to talk them out of getting married. I knew Jeff had a violent streak. Once when Tanya was living with me and my new husband, he tried to break down the door because he thought she had gone out with another boy. Unfortunately, her mom would be right. In the Tanya tapes, Tanya said she was fleeing the house to escape Galuli, beating her up when he ran to their car and pulled out a coil of the engine to keep her from driving away. As she was exiting the car, Tanya said that Galuli kicked the door shut and it completely closed with her hand in it. At that point, Tanya said she grabbed the bag she had brought outside with her and ran. In June of 1991, she filed for divorce, citing irreconcilable differences. She likewise filed a restraining order to keep him from entering her apartment or any skating rinks, writing, he wrenched my arm and wrist and he pulled my hair and shoved me. I recently found out he bought a shotgun and I'm scared for my safety. But this goes on for years. She meets another man. I think she gets engaged to him and then announces that she's getting back together with Jeff. And then they break up again, citing it has been an abusive relationship for the past two years. And he has assaulted me physically with his open hand and fist. That was July of 1993. In spring of 1993, the man she was dating was Tom Arendt, who spoke about Tanya to the Oregonian, saying that she would complain about Galuli, yet still contacted him often. He said that she couldn't stop talking to him. That summer, a man from Tanya's gym claimed to the Oregonian that she had offered to pay him to take care of Galuli, slap him around a little. He said he was offended and politely declined. They officially were granted a divorce in August of 1993. And then 10 days later, her lawyers asked the courts to withdraw the restraining order Tanya had because they wanted to get back together. In October of 1993, he had threatened her with a shotgun, according to Tanya. Once, when she was at her own apartment, he barged his way in and attempted to get Tanya to reconcile. She was able to escape her apartment, and he caught up with her in the parking lot and threatened to kill himself and her and made a rogue shot, and it ricocheted off the ground, and a piece of asphalt hit her in the face. A resident of the apartment heard the gunshot and then saw Jeff put Tanya in a car and speed off. They were nervous that, like, Tanya had been shot. So they called the police, and the police pulled them over. The officer then interviewed Tanya and Jeff separately about what had happened, but their stories did not match. Jeff Galuli first stated that the gun had fired when he was carrying it. Tanya then admitted that she had fired the gun and was worried about the publicity. 
Jeff said that Tanya had been moving her possessions into his truck when they started ar- an argument over his former girlfriend, and he declined to press charges. So, like, but we don't really know what happened there. Is Tanya taking the fall for that so Jeff won't get mad at her and they're trying to get back together? I have no idea. And then they would get back together, and this goes on well into 1994. Like, this is just their thing. Meanwhile, the entire time her life has been a mess, she has been very passionate about figure skating. She began skating at the age of three, training with coach Diane Rawlinson. In the mid-1980s, she started to get serious and start doing competitions when she was in her, so that's like early teens, 10, 11, 12, things like that. She placed sixth at the 1986 U.S. figure skating competitions, fifth in 1987 and 1988, and third in 1989. After competing in the February 1989 National Championship, Tanya began training with Dodie Teachman. She had a couple off years after being sick and placing very low in some competitions. It wouldn't be until 1991 when we really see Tanya Harding as we know her as, like, the excellent figure skater. So around the time she's 20 or 21. On February 16, 1991, Tanya Harding made history and really cemented herself as an Olympic contender. She was competing in the 1991 U.S. Championship when she became the first woman in history to successfully complete a triple axel in competition. You can watch the video. About 45 seconds into her routine, she attempted and landed the triple axel and immediately beamed with pride, pumping her fists a little bit. You can watch it. It actually is very cool to watch. She won the 1991 U.S. Ladies Singles title with the event's first 6.0 technical merit score since Janet Lynn's 1973 performance. Christy Yamaguchi, who earned the other two of the nine judges' first place rankings, had unfortunately fallen while attempting a jump. So it was sort of impossible to not give it to Tanya. And this is what I'm saying about, like, her upbringing and, like, the way she was perceived. She literally made history, and two judges still were, like, we're not going to give her first place. But Christy had fallen. Tanya, like, literally made history. It was impossible to not give it to her. Tanya said my horoscope said I was going to be perfect all week. I was counting on that. Tanya also won the long program when seven of the nine judges gave her first place. The competition that Tanya landed a triple axel and counted like one third towards the long program. And they had, I believe, three other routines that would weigh the remaining two thirds. She scored eight 5.9s, one 6.0 for technical merit and six 5.9s, one 5.8 and two 5.7s for composition and style. The entire thing was very shocking because they had all assumed this competition Christy Yamaguchi would be taking first place. The Washington Post said upsets in figure skating are extremely rare. Christy was 19 at the time. She had quit doubles to focus solely on skating and singles. Tanya had never made the world team because she always seemed to fall apart during competition, but that day Tanya had done something nobody had done and landed In addition to the triple axel, she landed six other perfect triple jumps. So it's not like one triple axel and like a shitty routine got her placed. She did amazing that day. So that was the national champions. A month later, she completed a triple axel again at the world championship. She still finished second to Christy Yamaguchi and in front of Nancy Kerrigan, who placed third. That would make the first time one country swept the ladies' medal podium at the world figure skating championships. So all three people on the podium were all American. Sandra Lucklow, who I mentioned earlier, who was doing the documentary about Tanya, would say everyone was willing at that moment to say this is somebody that we want as our champion. Unfortunately for Tanya, that would prove to be really the last time she was on top of her game. And most of that had to do with her home life and nothing to do with her skills. Because remember, as she was at the height of her career during these years, she was also at the very bottom of her relationship with Jeff Galuli. These are the years that they're like allegedly shooting each other, physically fighting, things like that. So at the September 1991 Skate America competition, Tanya recorded three more firsts. She was the first woman to complete a triple axel in the short program, the first woman ever to successfully execute two triple axels in a single competition, and the first ever to complete a triple axel in combination with the double toe loop. However, after this, she was never able to land the triple axel in competition again, She placed third in the January 1992 U.S. Figure Skating Championships despite twisting her ankle during practice and finished fourth in the February 1992 Winter Olympics. So she did go to the Olympics and she placed fourth. On March 1st, 1992, Tanya returned to Diane Rawlinson to be coached by her. 
On March 29th, Tanya placed sixth in the 1992 World Championships, although she had a better placement at the November 1992 Skate Canada International event, finishing in fourth. In 1994, she was on track to compete at the Olympics again. However, 1994 would prove to be a prolific year for Tanya for all the wrong reasons. Another woman who was in the same grouping as Tanya and who was also in line for the U.S. and World Figure Skating Championships to make the Olympics was Nancy Kerrigan. So like I said, Nancy Kerrigan's background was much different than Tanya's, and they are often contrasted against each other. Nancy was born October 13, 1969, to Daniel Daniel and Daniel Kerrigan. That's not correct. Her mom's name wasn't Daniel. Nancy was described as having a very supportive extended family. Her parents, brothers, aunts, uncles, and cousins all believed in her and would watch her compete and cheer for her. Very unlike Tanya's abrasive mom and abusive husband, Nancy's father sometimes worked three jobs to fund her skating career. He also drove the Samboni at a local rink in exchange for Nancy's lessons. She started training a little later than Tanya. Nancy started skating when she was about six as opposed to Tanya's three, and she didn't start private lessons until she was eight. That did not stop her from excelling, though, and ended up right alongside Tanya almost their entire professional career. So they have been linked for a while before this attack. They have been running in the same circles for a very long time. It was the 1991 U.S. Figure Skating Championship that Tanya landed her triple axel and that Nancy got her start in, like, professional competition skating. As we know, Nancy placed third below Tanya and Christy Yamaguchi. In the 1992 season, Nancy again improved on her placement at the previous year's national championships by finishing second. She won a bronze medal while Christy Yamaguchi took the gold in the 1992 Winter Olympics and earned the silver medal at the 1992 World Championships. That was the year Tanya placed fourth and sixth. In 1993, I believe Tanya placed fourth. However, Christy Yamaguchi had retired from competition, which made Nancy the United States champion, even though she had admittedly had a very flawed routine. She had a disaster of a free skate routine that placed her fifth. I think she had, like, fallen during competition. Like, it was just not a good thing. But technically speaking, she was the champion at the time, and then she fell to fifth. So... In 1994, with the Olympics coming up, she knew she needed to focus. She had all these endorsement deals from 1992 when she, like, had that really good season that she was working with places like Avion, Reebok, Campbell's. She had stopped all of those so she could focus on skating. She worked with a sports psychologist to mentally prepare and not be nervous. She was very ready to hunker down and put the 1993 disaster behind her and start fresh and make it back to the Olympics. However... 1994 would take a turn for Nancy, and maybe solely because Tanya Harding was also in the hunt for a spot on the Olympic team. I don't know if I mentioned it, but there, I think I do. There's only two spots for the Olympic team, and there's Tanya, Nancy, Michelle Kwan is also in the running, and there is another girl in the running for these two spots. So that's why this was sort of as chaotic as it was. So, in Detroit, Michigan, on January 6th, 1994, Nancy Kerrigan was training at the Kobo Center to get prepared for the U.S. Championships. And this practice of hers happened to be recorded, so a camera crew followed her off the ice into the hallway and then shut the camera off. Unbeknownst to the crew and Nancy, there was a man waiting behind them for the camera to turn off. So, as soon as Nancy got off the ice and came around the corner, the camera switched off and she was attacked by an assailant. She was bludgeoned on the right lower thigh with a police baton. The camera crew began recording again shortly after the attack and recorded Nancy sitting on the floor crying, surrounded by arena staff. This is, if you've ever seen the video, this is when Nancy is laying on the floor screaming, why, why, why? This footage was later broadcast around the world in news programs, and Nancy was then carried away to a changing room by her father. You can still watch this. If you even look up anything, I'm sure it's like the first video that comes up. She's literally holding her leg like, why, why, why? Nancy's coach said I heard screaming and all I could think of was where's Nancy and I thought she was okay because she wasn't on the ice but sure enough it was her and then she said great security. The man who attacked her immediately left after hitting her breaking the glass on a locked door and getting into the getaway car. While Nancy made a quick recovery she technically wasn't given a spot on the Olympic team due to her having to withdraw from the uh, championship. Instead Tanya Harding came in first Nicole Bobek and 13 year old Michelle Kwan followed. The Olympic team only had two slots, like I said, in 1994, so it seemed straightforward as to who would make it. It would be first and second place. However, 
The bylaws of the United States Figure Skating Association would allow a contestant to be placed on the Olympic team even if the skater hadn't competed in the national championships. So the idea was presented that Nancy Kerrigan would be taking one of the Olympic positions because she had paid her dues, she was talented, and her not competing in the championship was quite literally out of her control. They're basically saying, like, had Nancy competed, she would have won anyway, so is it really fair to leave her out because she was attacked and just technically could not compete that day? Tanya said, it's not my decision to make. If they decide not to take me, I'd accept that. Nicole Bobeck agreed, saying Nancy's been in this much longer than I've been. Michelle Kwan's coach, Frank Carroll, had a similar statement. What happened was no fault of Nancy's. It's a tragic thing. It might be more tragic to discard her if she was capable of going and skating well. I think, oh yeah, I did say, Michelle Kwan is 13 years old at this point. That's crazy to be, she almost went to the Olympics. Also, I was one of those kids who was like obsessed with figure skaters. So I did a lot of reports on Michelle Kwan and Christy Yamaguchi. So seeing their names out in the wild now was like a blast from the past. So one of Nancy's coaches said, I think we'd accept graciously if they send Nancy. She's paid her dues. She's come back strong this year. If they choose to do that, I think we will probably have our strongest team. In the end, the USFSA decided to send Nancy Kerrigan instead of the second place winner and sent an alternate in case Nancy did not heal in time. The alternate would end up being Michelle Kwan. That meant the U.S. figure skating Olympic team that year was Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. The irony of that is not lost on anyone. So the attack on Nancy does not go unsolved for long. The FBI started interviewing those closest to the situation, which meant Tanya and her entourage. And they didn't immediately zero in on her. They had a lot of crazed fans they were looking into. If you ever watch Blades of Glory, Nick Swartzen's character, people like that. But her direct competition is a good place to start, just logistically wise. Logistically? I don't think I need the word wise if I'm using the word logistically. Whatever. So her husband, ex-husband, whatever they're calling each other these days, and her bodyguard were being investigated. Jeff Galuli said, that's illegal. I wouldn't do that. I have more faith in my wife than to bump off her competition. Basically, like, first of all, morally, I wouldn't do that. And second of all, he's saying, like, I wouldn't need to do that because Tanya is better than Nancy anyway. Like, Tanya wouldn't need my help to do that. Her bodyguard did not care for the allegations either. He said, that is absurd. You know, I would never get involved in anything like that. That would be jeopardizing my future, my career. I mean, that's not something I could do or allow. But allegedly, someone got their hands on recording directly implicating those two men in the attack. Eugene S. Saunders, a 24-year-old Portland minister, told investigators that he had listened to a tape recording of Galuli and Eckert. Eckert is her um, bodyguard. I don't think I've said his actual name yet. And a third man described as a hitman from Arizona plotting to injure Nancy. So Saunders goes to Gary Crow, who was a PI. Crow knew both Saunders and the man who played the tape for him. So he is familiar with both of these people. It seems credible. Saunders retained a lawyer and went to the authorities that week. After questioning him, the FBI then talked to Crow on the very next day. Basically, what Crow told the FBI was that a Portland man with connections to Harding had approached Saunders' acquaintance and asked him to arrange an accident that would knock Kerrigan out of the figure skating competition. According to Crow's account, Saunders' acquaintance indicated that he could hire an Arizona man who would do the job for $100,000. He said he was told that at one point on the tape, one of the Port Portland men asked why Kerrigan couldn't just be killed. That idea was set aside, and the men instead decided to slug the skater on the knee to knock her out of the match. According to Crow, Saunders' acquaintance became worried when the man who allegedly hired the hit, failed to pay some or any of the money that had been promised and was receiving threats. So that's why this tape recording sort of comes out. On January 11th, Tanya was interviewed for KOIN TV in Portland, Oregon. She was asked whether someone she knew could have planned the attack, and Tanya said, I have definitely thought about it. No one controls my life but me. If there's something in there that I don't like, I'm going to change it. Like, as she's saying this to the camera crews, like, Jeff is behind the camera. Like, she's looking right at him. The day after... So January 12th, I think, her bodyguard confesses to his involvement in the attack and incriminates Sean Stant, the man who actually hit Nancy, Jeff Galuli, and Derek Smith, who was the man who drove the getaway car. On January 13th, the next day, two people were arrested, her bodyguard Sean Eckert and Derek B. Smith, a 29-year-old unemployed resident of Phoenix, Arizona. They were charged with one count of conspiracy to commit assault, which was a felony. They were held on $20,000 bail each. They said more arrests were to come, but clarified there were no plans to arrest Tanya Harding. On January 14th, Nancy gave a press conference after the people who attacked her were implicated and arrested. 
At the same time, it had been decided that Tanya was still permitted to compete at the Olympics because she technically hadn't been implicated in anything. Tanya testified with the FBI on January 18th where she said she sort of, like, sort of severed her ties with Jeff and maintains her innocence. She was interviewed over 10 hours. Eight hours into the interview, her lawyer read a statement declaring her separation from Galuli. said, I continue to believe that Jeff is innocent of any wrongdoing. I wish him nothing but the best. The full FBI transcript was released in February, like a month later. The Seattle Times reported on the transcript, saying that Tanya had changed her story well into a long interview. Hours after denying any involvement in trying to cover up the plot, an FBI agent finally told her that he knew she had lied to him and that he would tell her exactly how she had lied to him. She had lied about ever going to Eckert's house. When asked if she was ever at his house, she said no. The FBI told her that she knew she was lying, so she testified that she and Jeff Galuli went to Eckert's home on December 28, 1993. He went inside and she drove away. Tanya said that the Galuli phoned her one hour later asking her to pick him up. In the transcript's final passage, Tanya stated, I hope everyone understands that I'm telling on someone I really care about. I now know that Jeff is involved. I'm sorry. Jeff surrendered to the FBI the next day on January 19th after he learned there would be a warrant for his arrest. Jeff testified to the FBI on January 26th, where we finally get the full story of what happened. Well, allegedly, Jeff and Tanya's stories never match up because Tanya maintains that she had no prior knowledge of the attack on Nancy, and Jeff maintains that she was, like, very involved in the planning of the attack on Nancy. So we finally get the story that he is telling, like, the full story. So this all sort of comes up when Tanya was, like, placing kind of low... She was complaining about it, sort of complaining that, like, as the girl who was rough around the edges, she never really gets, like, the advantage and the deals the other girls do. She had finished fourth, and she thought she had definitely skated better than fourth place. Like, Jeff agreed and had been talking about that to Eckert around December 16th. So she's also alluding to, like, Nancy Kerrigan is getting all these deals, and, like, Tanya Harding is just as good, if not better, than Nancy, and she's getting offered nothing And it's just sort of because of the way that she is and the way she was brought up and, like, her reputation just from the jump was, like, not great. And she was just talking about, like, how sort of sick of it she is and, like, the possibility that she could not make the Olympics because of, like, a bias. So Jeff is relaying all of this conversation to her bodyguard, Eckert, around December 16th. Also, another factor they bring into this is money as the motivation. When they were questioning Tanya, they asked about her finances. And she said she had one checking account that was $109 overdrawn. Like I said, Tanya wasn't getting the fame and endorsement deals like Nancy and other skaters. And they had put together that, like, if Tanya made it and did well at the Olympics with all the endorsement deals coming from that, they could stand to make, like, a million dollars. Like, to them, the Olympics is, like, a million-dollar paycheck from the residuals coming off of that. So if you're wondering why Tanya's volatile ex-husband cares if she does well or not or cares enough to commit a crime, money is the answer. He wanted a cut of the money that she stood to get if she won the Olympics. So anyway, Jeff tells the FBI that it was actually Eckert's idea to hurt Nancy, and obviously Eckert claims that it was Jeff's idea. Either way, Eckert was into the idea because he figured if a prominent figure skater got attacked, that the other figure skaters might hire him to be their bodyguards also. So Jeff then says he floated the idea to Tanya, who Tanya maintains he very much did not do this, and Tanya liked the idea but was skeptical that Eckert could find anyone who would do something like that. And Jeff was basically like, trust me, Eckert knows like hordes of shady people but if he finds someone we don't like we can just pull the plug on it and we don't have to do it shortly after that it was actually Derek smith who called eckert himself smith lived in arizona at the time and was calling eckert about something completely different so they're chatting and smith is like what else is up so eckert was sort of like well actually and he explained that he had a client who needed someone taken care of not killed just like a little roughed up that would hopefully hopefully help his client and help him get some bodyguard work. Smith said, hold on, I think I have someone for you. He contacted 22-year-old Shane Stant. Stant really did not have a lot going on. He was a high school dropout. He never followed through with anything. He was just sort of floating by. So Eckert called Stant directly and explained that he needed a skater hurt and suggested that they cut her Achilles tendon. Stant was like, okay, well, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to be cutting anyone. So Eckert was like, okay, I will pay you $2,500 but the skater has to be unable to compete at the championships coming up in Detroit. And I think Stant was still kind of iffy, so Eckert was like, and I'll contract you for $36,000 as a bodyguard team for Tanya, which was a lie. 
But after that, he was in. He went to the store and purchased a black 21-inch retractable ASP tactical baton for $58.65. So Eckert then went to Jeff and Tanya and told them that the total cost of the plan was $4,500 for the fee, the tickets, a rental car, all kinds of stuff like that. Jeff said, uh, absolutely not. That was way more than they could pay, and they could only do 2000 total, which doesn't even cover the fee that Eckert told Stan. A few days later, Eckert tells Jeff that everyone he has hired was ready to go. Jeff said he told Eckert to call it off, but Eckert refused, saying his reputation was on the line and it was too late. On Christmas Day, Derek Smith called and said he was leaving to come to Portland and the differences could be figured out then. Because they're still fighting about money and all this stuff, he's like, I'm going to show up and we can all figure it out together. While the men were on their way, Eckert allegedly told Tanya and Jeff that it would be best to get them some information about Nancy. So allegedly Tanya called a journalist they knew, Vera Morano, and acted like she needed some information about Nancy to settle a bet between Tanya and Jeff. Vera Morano told the FBI on December 26, Tanya called her saying she needed to settle a bet. She asked Morano if she could find out where Nancy trained and if Nancy owned any property on Cape Cod because they're trying to figure out where Nancy lives. Morano told Tanya that she would try and get that information and would get back to her. So Tanya called Dorothy Baker, who was a member of the U.S. Figure Skating Association. Baker told Morano that Kerrigan trained at Tony Kent Arena on Cape Cod but would not provide any information about Kerrigan's place of residence. Rano called Tanya back and left that information on the answering machine. There was some confusion over the name of the arena. They couldn't really hear on the answering machine, so it kind of sounded like the Toby Kent Arena, Tuna Can Arena, I think they write, and I, Tanya, something like that. So Jeff said Tanya called Rano back and had her spell it out. Then they found a brochure with Nancy's picture on it to give the attacker. On December 28th, Smith and Stant were in Portland and wanted to meet with everyone involved, so Jeff drove him and Tanya over to Eckert's house. Allegedly, Jeff said Tanya did not want to have direct contact with the hitmen, so she dropped Jeff off and took their car and left. So Tanya's not there for this meeting, allegedly. Remember remember what I'm telling you is what Jeff is saying. So all this stuff about Tanya may or may not be true. We will never know. While Jeff was getting there, Smith had Eckert turn on a tape recorder and record the conversation as leverage in case Jeff didn't want to pay. So this is the tape conversation that was referenced earlier. And it is very convenient that Tanya just so happened to not be at this part of the planning, you know, where there's actual proof of this happening, but was part of everything else. If you're like Team Tanya, this is like very shady that she just just so happened to not be there, but she was involved with everything else. Jeff gave them the information he had on Nancy and explained that if this all went well and Tanya made it to the Olympics, that he would be able to hire them at $1,000 a week because of all the endorsement deals and money Tanya would bring in from the Olympics. However, Nancy was the big thing in the way of that, so she needed to be dealt with. They again discussed how to disable Nancy. Smith and Stamp both stated that Eckert again suggested to cut her Achilles, and everyone was sort of like, no, that's a bit much. Eckert then suggested getting a shitty car and running her off the road to break a few ribs. Again, everyone involved was like, no. Jeff then explained to the others that Kerrigan's right leg was her landing leg. He said he'd verified that the day before with Tanya, and that was the leg to be disabled. Jeff and Stant then both said Eckert said it would be easier to just kill Nancy and then was fantasizing about getting a sniper positioned in a way that could kill Nancy. Again, everyone's sort of like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Like, we're just trying to disable this woman for a little bit. I don't know why you keep bringing up this weird shit. So eventually they decided that someone would break Nancy's landing leg and leave a note to make it look like a crazy stalker did it to drum up business for his bodyguard gig. They decided on $6,000 with $2,000 up front, and if the people Eckert hired couldn't get it done, that Jeff would get his $2,000 back. After he left the meeting, Jeff told the FBI that he talked with Tanya in the car about it. Tanya asked him how the meeting went. He said not bad. He then told her that the other men had offered him a money-back guarantee. Tanya laughed, and Jeff told her that he was serious, that they said if they couldn't get the job done, they would get their money back. He said that for $2,000, it was not a bad deal, better than playing the lottery. Then he described the people at the meeting and said that he felt more comfortable with Derek than with Eckert. Tanya asked him how he felt about the scheme. Jeff said pretty good, but he would leave a final decision up to her. Tanya said she wanted to leave it up to Jeff, and Jeff said, I think we should go for it. And Tanya said, okay, let's do it. However, they needed more information on Nancy's skate times. So Tanya called the Tony Kent Arena and just asked him for Nancy's skating times in the arena, gave them to her. She's obviously not saying it's Tanya Harding. She's, like, under a fake name. According to Jeff, Tanya told him that stupid bitch gave it to me. The woman at the Tony Kent Arena had told them that Kerrigan's private ice time was noon to 3. Tanya then had to call back to get the address because she had forgot. They then ripped the covers off of some magazines they had at home that had their address on them. They ripped their addresses off, though. So, like, their own personal magazines and gave them to Stanton Smith because they needed more pictures of Nancy. 
So Stant then leaves Portland to get to Boston, which is a disaster. He'd went to down to Dallas and stayed at the Hilton and then tried to rent a car to go to Boston, but realized he didn't have his credit card with him. He only brought his girlfriend's credit card, and the rent-a-car place wouldn't give it to him. So he spends days trying to figure that out. He eventually gets to Boston and starts following Nancy around, staying at her training arena all day and moving his car every half hour. Literally every half hour on the hour he moved his car. Meanwhile, Smith had already left to go back to Phoenix, and there had been no word on the plan. Eckert didn't even know where the people he hired were supposed to be at in Boston. He had heard from, like, nobody. When Eckert told Jeff that Derek had called to ask when he could expect the rest of the expense money, Jeff said, Do I look like I have stupid written across my forehead? Because, like, nothing had happened yet. Like, what do you mean you need more money? More money for what? They can't even get a hold of anyone. When January 1st rolled around and nothing happened, Jeff and Tanya assumed that the money was gone and that the plan wasn't happening. Jeff tried one last time, showing Eckert a $10,000 check they had received from the U.S. FSA and asked if that would motivate the people he hired. Meanwhile, Stant was just wandering around Boston and the training arena, and on January 3rd learned that Nancy was no longer there and was on her way to Detroit for Nationals. Tanya was pissed, because remember, the whole thing was, you have to do this before she goes to Detroit to go to Nationals. Smith had told Eckert that Stant told him that Nancy wasn't training there that much, so he never had the time to catch her because she was resting. So Tanya called the arena and learned that Nancy had been training there regularly and she was there that very morning. Like, there were plenty of opportunities to do this. So then Tanya flies out to Detroit for nationals because, remember, she's competing in the same competition. And on January 4th, Jeff gets a message from Stan on his answering machine telling him that he was in Detroit now. So Jeff calls Eckert and he is livid. Explained, like, the hit cannot happen in Detroit, like, when Tanya and all of us are around. Like, this had to happen in Boston and it didn't. Eckert at first was like, well, he's already there, so, like, we're just going to do it there. But then he said he wired Stant $750 to go home. Like, the plan is off, go home. However, Smith and Stant both think that $10,000 is still on the line. Like, they think they are getting that $10,000. So Smith flies from Phoenix to Detroit, rents a car, and picks up Stant. This whole time, allegedly, Jeff, Tanya, and Eckert think the plan is off. They think it's done, didn't happen, whatever. On January 5th, Stant and Smith purchased tickets to the arena to watch the practice session. They scoped out all the entrances and exits and made note of where skaters entered and exited from. The arena was supposed to be secured, but Stant was able to walk down to the ice level, pass through a blue curtain, and stroll down the hallway leading to the skaters' lockers room. The skaters' locker room. He scoped the place out for 45 minutes without being challenged by security. They briefly entertained the idea of doing the attack at the hotel, but the escape route would take too long, so they settled on doing it in the hallway of the arena where they saw a glass door right at the end. So, like, they know they can whack Nancy and just run straight down the hallway out the door. So, on January 6th, Smith and Stant enter the arena. Stant told Smith that he would sit near the blue curtain where the skaters entered the ice and that Smith was to sit on the opposite side of the arena. Stant said that when he spotted Kerrigan and the assault was imminent, he would stand up and sit down. That would be the signal for Smith to go get the car and bring it around to that door. According to an old Sports Illustrated article, Stant took a seat about seven rows up from the ice. Fifteen minutes later, he watched Kerrigan take the ice. He waited until her name was announced. Then he stood up and sat down. Smith left the arena to get the car. Stant watched Kerrigan skate, watching for video recorders so he wouldn't be photographed. After her session at about 2.35 p.m., Nancy left the ice. Stant got up from his seat. Nancy was followed by a cameraman from ABC, and when the man laid down his camera and turned to his left, Stant darted around him to the right. Two men were standing at the blue curtain, but Stant walked right past them. He saw no security people. Nancy stopped in the hall outside the dressing room and spoke to Dana Scarton of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Stant drew the baton out of his belt with his right hand, and according to his statement, clutched the madman note with his left. Swiftly, he walked between Kerrigan and Scarton. He struck one quick, vicious blow to Nancy's right leg, Just above the knee and then bolted. Kerrigan screamed again and again. She screamed. Stant says he dropped the note as he began to run. The plexiglass doors he had seen the day before were chained together. So without pausing, he crashed through the lower part of one of the doors using his head as a ram and then sprawled out onto the sidewalk. Behind him, a voice cried out, somebody stop him. He ran into the getaway car, changed his jacket, and they left. An hour later, Tanya called Jeff and told him that Nancy was attacked and that Jeff called Eckert to tell him. And then we know that this attack immediately fell apart and they all got caught caught, thanks to the recording from Eckert's house. Tanya expressed to the media through her friend Stephanie that she was disappointed that Jeff was involved and that she really believed in him. On January 27th, Tanya released a statement that she did not know about the attack before, but she did find out when she got home from Nationals on the 10th. 
She said, I would like to begin by saying how sorry I am about what happened to Nancy Kerrigan. I am embarrassed and ashamed to think that anyone close to me could be involved. I was disappointed not to have the opportunity to compete against Nancy at Nationals. I have a great deal of respect for Nancy. My victory at Nationals was unfulfilling without the challenge of skating against Nancy. I had no prior knowledge of the planned assault on Nancy Kerrigan. I am responsible, however, for failing to report things I learned about the assault when I returned home from Nationals. Many of you will be able, unable to forgive me for that. It will be difficult to forgive myself. When I returned home Monday, January 10, 1994, I was exhausted but still focused on the national championships. Within the next few days, I learned that some persons that were close to me may have been involved in the assault. My first reaction was one of disbelief, and the disbelief was followed by shock and fear. I have since reported this information to the authorities. Although my lawyers tell me that my failure to immediately report this information is not a crime, I know I have let you down, but I have also let myself down. But I still want to represent my country in Lillehammer, Norway next month. That's the Olympics. Despite my mistakes and rough edges, I have nothing. I have done nothing to violate the standards of excellence of sportsmanship that are expected in an Olympic athlete. Nancy Kerrigan and I can show the world two different types of figure skating. I look forward to being on the team with her. I have devoted my entire life to one objective, living, winning an Olympic medal for my country. This is my last chance. I ask only for your understanding and the opportunity to represent my country with the best figure skating performance of my life. Thank you. So after Jeff implicates her hardcore in this planning, Tanya comes out and admits that while she didn't know before the attack happened, she found out after the attack happened that it was people that she knew and she didn't report it. That's what she's saying she's guilty of. On February 1st, Jeff pled guilty as a part of a plea bargain in exchange for the detailed testimony that he gave that I just read you. and He got two years in prison and had to pay a $100,000 fine, which was the most harsh stance of the five involved. And he apologized to Tanya. He was released from prison in March of 1995. So Jeff and Eckert pled guilty to racketeering, while Stant and Smith pled guilty to conspiracy to commit second-degree assault. Smith, Stant, and Eckert had no fines, and they were sentenced to 18 months in prison. Tanya went to the Olympics as planned, with Tanya and Nancy practicing together. It was a media shit show, obviously. It's Regina George and Katie Heron. It's a girl who was attacked and the girl that people think attacked her. On February 23, 1994, Tanya had a disastrous routine when her lace broke and she was sobbing to the judges. You can see these pictures. It is kind of sad. She is distraught. She was allowed to restart after she quickly fixed her shoe, but it wasn't enough. Tanya placed eighth while Nancy Kerrigan won a silver medal behind Oksana Bayul wearing the same skating outfit she wore when Stant whacked her knee. On March 16th, Tanya Harding pled guilty to conspiracy to hinder prosecution as a Class C felony offense at a Multnomah County court hearing. One of the big reasons this happened was someone found a piece of garbage at a restaurant that Tanya was at, and it was an envelope with a bunch of things written on it. Things like Cape Cod and a Boston address and Tony Kent Arena were written on it, and a handwriting expert took samples from Tanya, and it was confirmed that it was her handwriting. So now it's sort of looking like maybe she did the things that Jeff said she did. She and her lawyer, Robert Weaver, negotiated a plea agreement, ensuring no further prosecution, so she can't be charged for anything else involved with this. Harding's penalties included three years of probation, a $100,000 fine, and 500 hours of community service. She was the only one not to be sentenced to jail time. On June 29th, the USFSA disciplinary panel met for nine hours over two days to consider Harding's alleged role in the attack. Although Harding did not show up for the two-day hearing before a five-member panel in Colorado Springs, the board decided she knew about the January 6th attack on Kerrigan before it happened, which is the first time an official body had come to that conclusion in this case. They said, by a preponderance of the evidence, the five members of the panel concluded that she had prior knowledge and was involved prior to the incident. This is coming from panel chairman William Heibel in a telephone interview. He said this is based on civil standards, not criminal standards. Tanya was stripped of her 1994 U.S. championship title and banned for life from participating in U.S. FSA events as either a skater or a coach. This was obviously very widely publicized, but both Tanya and Nancy had some bad fallout from this. Tanya's ex-husband Jeff sold a sex tape of them that a magazine posted stills of. She never really recovered career-wise. She worked as a contractor. She worked at Sears. She tried boxing for a while. She said she would do anything to keep a roof over her head. She said, my reputation has drastically changed from being great to being nothing and trash back to just being me. On February 22, 2000, Tanya attacked her then-boyfriend, Darren Silver, repeatedly punching him in the face and throwing a hubcap at his head. The attack left Silver with a bloodied face, and Tanya was arrested. She initially pled not guilty to misdemeanor charges, 
But in a May trial in Clark County District Court, she admitted to attacking Silver when sentenced to three days in jail, 10 days of community service, and a suspended jail sentence of 167 days. She married 42-year-old Joseph Price on June 23, 2010, when she was 39 years old and gave birth to a son named Gordon on February 19, 2011. In 2018, she had a resurgence with the release of I, Tanya. She went on Ellen and revealed that she still skates and trains with her old trainer. She was also on Dancing with the Stars in 2018 and came in third. Nancy Kerrigan, who was sort of looked at as like America's sweetheart, got immediate bad press at the Olympics where she won the silver medal after her attack. She and the third place finisher were standing on the podium for over 20 minutes while someone was trying to track down the Ukrainian national anthem to play when Oksana was medaled. Someone told Nancy it was because Oksana cried all of her makeup off and was getting touched up. To which out loud Nancy said, oh come on, so she's going to get out here and cry again, what's the difference? In a pretty frustrated tone, which the cameras caught and aired, obviously, so she's on camera acting like a brat after winning a silver medal. She then didn't attend the closing ceremonies of those Olympics, she said, because of a safety reason. However, she left to go to Disney in Norway because she had a pre-planned $2 million appearance at the parade. At that parade, she was immediately put in hot water again. She was caught on microphone saying to Mickey Mouse, this is dumb, I hate it, this is the corniest thing I've ever done. She later said her remark was taken out of context, and she was not commenting on being in the parade, but rather on her agent's insistence that she wear her silver medal in the parade. She said that her parents had always taught her not to show off or brag about her accomplishments. She added that she had nothing against Disney or Mickey Mouse. She said, who could find fault with Mickey Mouse? He's the greatest mouse I've ever known. Which I just don't buy that. I think she definitely was complaining about the parade. I understand not to show off or brag about your accomplishments, but, like, you literally won an Olympic medal, and now you're in a parade in the country where the Olympics were. Like, I think it's not that outlandish to assume you will have to wear your Olympic medal. Nancy continued to skate professionally, leaving competition skating behind after that. She was on Dancing with the Stars in 2017 and was eliminated in the seventh week. Tanya says she has apologized enough, and if she saw Nancy today, she'd like to give her a hug and say a few kind words. She said, I would tell her how proud I am of her being able to go forward with her life, and congratulations on her children. She's moved on, I've moved on. It's part of history that will always be with us, but it's time to move on. In 2014, Nancy Kerrigan addressed the scandal during a brief interview with sportscaster Bob Costas. She said, whatever apology Tanya has given, I accept it. It's time for all of us. I've always wished Tanya well. She has her own family. I have my family. It's time to make that our focus and move on with our lives. And that was the assault of Nancy Kerrigan. I don't know what I believe. I am inclined to believe that she knew about it beforehand, but but I don't know. Maybe she didn't. And we'll never know. She'll never, ever admit if she did do that, she'd never admit that she knew before. Absolutely not. So let me know what you think. Let me know if you thought Tanya knew before, if you think Tanya only found out afterwards. I think finding that note in the garbage was pretty damning, given that it had all of the information on it that Jeff had testified Tanya wrote down months before. It's not like they found this note and then Jeff testified that she was writing this stuff down. That's exactly what he said that she was doing on the phone when they were trying to figure out where Nancy trained and where she would be at. If it wasn't for that, I think I would lean much more towards she didn't know until after. But it's hard to argue against that specific piece of evidence. And it wasn't even worth it. She didn't even place. She placed fourth. She didn't even get a medal at all. And the whole thing was for her to get, she wanted to get a gold medal. So they incapacitated Nancy. But the thing was... It was a big deal amongst the people who did it because Nancy was supposed to get hit in the knee, which is a completely different type of injury than above the knee. Not that it's not as bad, but I feel like whacking a knee will really put a person out for a while. But all she had above the knee was some like, she had like muscle bruising and regular bruising, like surface and below bruising. So it healed pretty easily and she was able to compete in the Olympics just fine. But had they gotten the knee, it's quite possible that Nancy isn't able to make the Olympics. And then Tanya, who knows what would have happened. Tanya, at the very least, would have come in third because that would have bumped her up from fourth. But who knows? It could have it could have been much worse for Nancy, and Tanya could have gotten a lot more out of it if it was done correctly. But she aligned herself with a bunch of goddamn bozos. I've never seen a more motley crew of people trying to commit a conspiracy crime. So yeah, let me know what you think. I will see you Monday, Wednesday. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what I've got coming up next for you. This is my last recording of the day, February, January, February. 
that's not right. I meant to say Friday. <laughs> Friday, January 26th. I get my tonsil surgery in just a few days. So I was trying to get a lot of this done that way. There is no trying to suffer through doing a recording to get you something that's sort of half-assed. I wanted to line you up with some good ones just in case. So I hope you have enjoyed these. I had been working on them for about a month now just so I could do some get you good researched long episodes to get you through this time. I hope I'm getting your Patreon episodes out for you on time. Those are the ones I didn't have very many pre-recorded of just because they are kind of hard for me to... I've said this for like the past 100 episodes. They're hard for me to research. I need better ideas on shorter episodes because without Taryn here, the timing is a lot different. Three to four pages used to get me a perfectly timed short episode. Now it has to be around five to six pages. And at that point, if I can get five to six pages, I can usually get eight to nine. And then with digging in a little deeper, I can get to 10 and that gives me a full episode. So it is kind of hard for me to know when to stop. So if you have any ideas, head over to madisonshelby.com and suggest me some short episodes. And I hope you have a great rest of the rest of <laughs> I hope you have a great rest of your week and a great weekend. Wish me luck on my tonsil surgery. Wish me luck on my recovery. Suggest a case. Check out the website if you want more pictures. And if you want to read about the case, and I will see you next week. All right, thank you so much for sticking with me. Bye.